Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, nice to see you all at FOSDEM this year. Um, nice to see you even virtually, if not in person. So this afternoon, um, I'm going to be talking about Spark in ACL, which is a cryptographic library written in Spark, um, which I'm sure most of you already know is a subset of ADA um, and associated tooling. Um, this was a kind of a lockdown side project for me. It started out as a bit of fun just to do some pro programming work during lockdown um, and then kind of became a bit more serious as I got it more towards a, a production level of quality. So what I want to talk about then in order um, is to start by talking a little bit about something called Tweet NACL, which is an existing version of the NACL crypto library, which I started from. Tell you a bit about that and then tell you, well, why am I bothering to do this in the first place? What caught my interest about it? Um, I'll tell you about the goals um, that I set myself for this project. I'll also tell you what my goals definitely weren't um, in terms of things I didn't want to try to achieve. Um, the two main technical contributions, I suppose, are firstly a section I'll talk about the proof work on the software. So this is about the formal verification of the Spark version and what I was able to verify and what I wasn't able to verify. Then we'll talk about the performance side, which is kind of saying, well, OK, we've verified it, but can we actually make it go fast enough to be competitive with the C code um, without breaking the proof as well, um, which is a very interesting adventure. And I'll talk about, finally, um, some further work and ideas that we might have to take it further. So moving straight ahead, what is NACL? Well, OK, NACL on its own, sometimes pronounced SALT, or, or it, it actually stands for Networking and Crypto Library, but no one calls it that. Um, people refer to it as libsalt or libsodium sometimes. Um, NACL is, I guess, you could describe it as the specification um, for a cryptographic library's API, which embodies a number of particularly um, recent or, or, or um, cryptographic algorithms. Um, and there are there are many implementations of NACL written in different languages. There are implementations in C, um, Python, Rust, C++, you name it. Um, lots of languages have implementations. Um, but there are particularly well-regarded implementations of this, which have been subject to a lot of quality control, and it is very highly regarded um, as, a, as a piece of software. Um, Tweet NACL is an implementation of the NACL API which is written in C, and it has some rather unusual properties. Um, this version of NACL was actually written and, and designed by the people that, that designed um, the API in the first place. So a rather odd property of Tweet NACL is that the whole software, all of the source code for Tweet NACL for the whole library, can be tweeted in 100 tweets. Now, this is a slightly strange thing to do. Um, Firstly, it's an exercise in demonstrating that a useful cryptographic library can actually be done in such an amazingly small amount of code, um, which is an achievement in itself. And secondly, it's a little bit of an exercise in saying, well, you know, demonstrating that you can distribute this kind of stuff to the whole world by tweeting it um, without having to get in the way of any copyright or distribution or export controls or anything like that. So... As a, as a result of trying to get the thing down to 100 tweets, um, one issue is that there are really actually almost no comments in the code whatsoever. So it is spectacularly difficult to understand how it works. And I'll show you a bit of the code um, in a minute or two that will illustrate that. Um, there is a technical paper, about 16 pages, that describes how the library is put together. Um, this is really rather succinct in a paper, and it, it makes sense if you understand the mathematics of things like elliptic curves and all these other algorithms. Um, but if you're not a hardcore crypto mathematician like me, if you're a software engineer, it's pretty difficult reading this paper. Um, and trying to understand the code is still pretty difficult. Um, and the assurance for Tweet and ACL largely rests on things like, well, there are lots of people using it. Um, there are significant, um, some significant users. Um, I believe a, a, a version of it has been reused in something um, called the WireGuard VPN system, which is widely used um, and, and it is built into many Linux distros these days. So there are lots of users um, and the designers of NACL, uh, particularly a chap called Dan, Dan Bernstein and his colleagues, do have a very formidable reputation as cryptographic mathematicians, certainly. Um, but it's interesting to look at a piece of code like that and say, well, you know, is it really actually trustworthy and has it got any bugs in it? And if we applied state of the art formal verification tools, what would we find? So that's kind of where I came from. I thought, well, OK, let's just rewrite it in Spark and, and, and see what we get. Um, what you get with Tweet and ACL, um, the algorithm set you get um, 
are a number of modern cryptographic algorithms. So Salsa 20 is a, um, a modern stream cipher. There's an authenticator called Poly1305. It uses a standard hash algorithm, just, just the 512-bit variant of SHA-2. Um, and for signatures and key exchanges, it uses an elliptic curve called Curve25519, um, on top of which is built the Edge25519 signature scheme. And you can also use it to establish a, a shared secret um, using a, the, the, the variant of ECDH. Um, built on that elliptic curve. So you get a really useful um, set of primitives with it uh, with which you can do most most things that you would want to do. So it is really a useful library in so little code, it's quite surprising. So as I said, looking at the C code, when I originally looked at it, I just looked at it and thought, gosh, I don't get this. How, did, how is this possibly, possibly working? Because as I said, there were no comments. Um, there's also a bit of trickery going on where the code is doing some cunning mathematical tricks to achieve an acceptable level of performance. The code is doing some interesting mathematical trickery um, to, to make things like the elliptic curve operations go sufficiently fast. Um, it's not as highly optimized as some libraries um, that you might come across, so it's not written in assembler or doing some really wild things, but it is still pretty difficult to understand. Um, secondly, it is programmed in a fashion called constant time programming style. So the idea here is that the running time of the algorithms does not vary um, in a way that depends upon any variable or any any input variable of any of the algorithms, if you like. So this is to defend the algorithms against um, side channel attacks based upon the execution time of the algorithm. Um, and that makes for the code being more difficult to understand because you look at a piece of code and think what on earth's going on and then you think oh well why didn't they just write you know it'd be much easier if you wrote this out as an if statement and then you say oh they can't write an if statement because you'd be testing a sensitive variable and you can't branch based on a sensitive variable so it's kind of written in a slightly weird way um in this constant time style um and finally as i said the paper is rather terse um so here's an example of, of what the paper says and then what the code looks like so, for example, here's a rather marvellous paragraph um, from the paper. There's, there's an algorithm in, in the um, signing um, algorithm. There's an, there's an algorithm that reduces a number, a large number, um, modulo a big number called the order of the group. Um, and you think, OK, and this one paragraph is the description of this whole code function in, in the library. And you look at that and you think, huh, what on earth is that about? Um, and uh, yeah, well, mm, yeah, and, and is that really right? Well, yeah, except actually when you get down into the weeds of it, um, I mean, as, as a sort of um, something I found while doing the formal verification of this code, there is actually a mistake in this paragraph, and I'm sure you all spotted it, right? Obvious. Um, it's a harmless mistake, I'm pleased to say, but there is actually a factual error in this paragraph. I won't tell you where it is yet. Um, but that one paragraph is the only description you get of some code. Um, just for the sake of readability, we just introduce a couple of things to make it readable. Um, there's a couple of type defs you need to know about. There's a, a, a signed integer 64 called I64 that the code uses. There's a type called GF, which is a, an array of 16 of those signed 64-bit values. So the GF type is used to represent you know, very large numbers, basically. It's an array of integers where each integer is like the digit, a digit of an array of um, of digits. Um, and those are used to represent numbers um, which are points on the elliptic curve. So this is a, a type that's, that's all over the place in the software. It then uses a couple of hash defines um, just to make, um, to abbreviate a couple of common idioms. Um, which makes the code shorter and therefore easier to fit in 100 tweets. But, so that paragraph of mathematical stuff becomes that code uh, in the tweet in ACL distribution. And you look at that and you think, wow, what on earth is going on there? Um, if you look here, you can see all these um, mathematical operators. There's lots of, there's various multiplications and additions and subtractions and shifting and Imagine every single one of those operators. You've got to convince yourself that that's not... And these, these are all signed integer operations. So remember that in C, signed integer operations are undefined behavior on overflow. So you've got to convince yourself that every one of those could never overflow or underflow in any way. Um, that's pretty difficult to do. And it's pretty difficult to see how this code works at all. Um, let alone know it's doing the right thing and, and, and you're not going to be undefined or anything. So that's the kind of scale of the challenge that, that you're faced with this kind of code.
Um, so why why did I even bother to do this? There, there's in the last five to ten years, I guess, there's been a real explosion in interest in this field, and um, particularly you know people doing formal development or formal verification of cryptographic code. Um, there's been many many notable achievements in this area from people like Microsoft Research. Um, Amazon Web Services, the people at Galois uh, out in the States with their Cryptol and, and, and Saw um, tool sets. There's a system called Jasmine and EasyCrypt, which is extremely strong, an effort called HackSpec Hack with Rust to specify and refine cryptographic code, fiat cryptography, and probably as many more projects, again, that I've forgotten to mention, and I apologize to anyone who's, who's you know feels aggrieved that I've forgotten to mention their favorite project. But there's lots and lots of very impressive results in this area. Um, also, there's very highly respected implementations of NACL out there already, particularly the kind of benchmark implementation that, that many other distributions are based upon is called Libsodium. Um, and Libsodium is very highly regarded. It has been subject to a great deal of audit and analysis. Um, it is also extremely efficient because bits of it are implemented in assembly language for particular targets and, and they use some extraordinary tricks to make the thing go very, very fast. Um, and that's that's a really 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 well respected implementation. So so you know why bother doing another implementation of NACL? Well, I really wanted to see, particularly with Spark twenty fourteen, since the, the language was was you know um, so significantly enhanced with um, Spark twenty fourteen and modern day proof engines. Um, I wanted to see if the proof system could deal with code of this kind of complexity this kind of mathematical nature using this constant time programming style to see if the tools could cope with 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 code of this nature. Um, so what could we prove? Could we prove that it's, you know, so called type safe or, or, you know, free of runtime errors and prove the code couldn't raise an exception, for example? Or could we do more? Could we actually go on to prove some some more advanced sort of correctness properties? Um, I'm also interested in automation, meaning can I get the theorem proving tools to prove everything automatically so you just push the button and it says yes everything is okay and it proves all of the verification conditions um automatically with one or more of the of the main proof engines because i don't want to be involved with having to check false alarms um, from the proof tool i don't definitely don't want to have to be firing up some sort of interactive proof tool to kind of finish off the proving job i want to automate the thing completely um, so it'd be interesting to see what level of automation can be achieved so there's also a myth that I come across working in industry. I come across this quite a lot. Um, there is a general perception I see in industry that people think that formal languages are either too slow or not compatible with people's target hardware and, and can't, uh, are sort of unusable in the real world where the real world might be, uh, you know, running on a, a small embedded target, um, something that's not got much memory or much computing power, or these days, not much battery power. People are very interested in power consumption as well as speed. Um, but there is this perception that formal languages are sort of too slow or too big for, for production use. Um, this is often restated uh, in a way it sort of comes out in the wash and people say, well, this code has to be really fast and really efficient and it's got to run on this little embedded target so we can program it in C, 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 C or C or any language that starts with C or possibly assembly language. And languages like Spark don't even get a look in. People don't consider that it could be done in Spark. And I, I was interested in seeing if that really was the case. Um, and seeing if we can achieve both efficiency at execution time and also the level of assurance and proof that we can do with Spark and see if we can, can get both of those at the same time. So what goals did I set myself and not set to myself? Um, so I wanted to do the whole library. I didn't just pick on one of those cryptographic algorithms. I decided I'd do the whole library, all of the algorithms. So did that, fine. Um, obviously, my new library should at least pass all the regression tests um, that exist for tweet and ACL. And indeed it does. And that's fine. That's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, the implementation retains the constant time property of, um, of the programming. Um, that's important. That stuff about avoidance of the side channel attack um, from timing variation. It is an important property of the library. And I've, I decided I had to retain that um, to see if the tools could deal with it as well. Um, and what I really set my goal on was this idea that I'd get a completely automatic proof of at least um, what so-called type safety, where type safety in ADA terms basically means proving that the program could never raise an exception at runtime, but also covers things like the complete um, 
uh, getting rid of all possibility of undefined behavior or erroneous behavior and so on. Um, autoactive is a, a term that was, was, I believe, coined by Rustin Leno, who used to work for Microsoft Research and more recently works for Amazon. Um, autoactive is a sort of a portamento of automatic and interactive. So it's this idea that the proof is automatic in that you just press the button and it works, but it's interactive in that to make it automatic, you have to write contracts in the code, where contracts are things like assertions, preconditions, postconditions, loop invariants, and so on. So there is a bit of work involved. You actually have to think. But every once you've got it in the code, once you've got those contracts in place, the proof is completely automated. Um, because I really didn't want to have to fire up an interactive proof tool like uh, Isabel or Cock or any of any of those other tools, because I know from experience they're not much fun to drive. Uh, another goal was that the library for bare metal kind of very small embedded targets i wanted the whole library to be compatible with the zero footprint runtime which is implemented by Gannett. so that means you put the compiler in a particular mode and it never ever generates a call to the ada runtime library um, so that the code will effectively run on anything um, there's no dependencies on any other code like packages or libraries there's no cots components at all and the whole library is programmed in this sort of heap free style um, so there's no use of, of dynamic allocation or deallocation or anything. It needs a bit of stack memory, and that's basically all. And it's completely portable. The same code compiles, if you can compile it, I assume, uh, it will run on anything, any 32 or 64-bit machine. Um, it should just work straight out of the box. Uh, I wanted the performance to be, shall we say, competitive with Tweet and ACL. We'll see how we go. We'll come back to that. Um, and will we find any bugs? If I actually attempt this verification... Will I actually find bugs in my code, which turn out to be bugs in the original master copy from Tweet and ACL? Uh, we have some form in this area. We, I, I did a similar exercise some years ago with a, a hash algorithm called Skane. Um, and in doing that verification in Spark, I found a bug in the Skane algorithm, or at least the implementation of the Skane algorithm in C um, from, the, from the designers of the algorithm. It actually had a, a very subtle uh, arithmetic overflow bug in it which had never been discovered uh, before by anyone else. So, so we have some sort of form in this regard. Um, what I didn't want to do, um, I'm not going to try and compete with Libsodium in terms of performance because that would be silly. I'm not going to compete with very carefully crafted assembly language. Um, I'm not going to try to prove partial correctness um, of actual you know, heavyweight mathematical correctness properties of the code. That seemed probably a bit ambitious. Um, and I'm not trying to say anything about the mathematical security of things like the elliptic curve, curve 25519. That's a, a, the domain of crypto mathematicians, not software engineers. So I'm not sort of sort of venturing into that territory. OK, so on the proof work, firstly, a few statistics for you. It's about 1700 logical lines of code. Um, comprising statements and declarations and slightly over 100 subprograms um, that's 74 functions and, and uh, sorry 74 procedures and 37 functions um, in terms of contracts this is a bit interesting um, there's quite a lot of types and subtypes as you know from using ADA um, types and subtypes are sort of um, super important in, um, in the correct use of the language but other contracts there's 27 preconditions 20 explicit post conditions um, dynamic subtypes or dynamic subtype predicates turn out to be really important. I think they are something of a killer feature of Ada 2012, which, which the Spark tools can exploit. There is a few of those. And there are 51 um, explicit assertions in the code, assert pragmas. That's quite a lot. And that reflects the difficulty of some of the proof that we have to do is that the asserts are used to kind of help the prover, if you like, to kind of give it a hint of things it should prove first before it can prove C, you should prove B and before B, you should prove A. Well, you can kind of do that with by giving it assertions. So there's quite a few intermediate assertions in the code that we'll come back to. Um, Proving things about loops is often tricky. Uh, I had a quick look. There were 56 loop statements in the library. Interestingly, of those 56, 25 don't require any loop invariance at all to be stated by the user. The tool just synthesizes something and that's enough to prove what we want to prove. Um, 18 of them require a user written loop invariant, but it's really simple. It just took me about you know 30 seconds to write the correct loop invariant and it was done. And only 13 of them are sufficiently hard that I had to write a loop invariant um, and it actually took some real work and some real thinking to get it out. But I, I will admit those 13 were actually quite tricky. 
Um, if you look in the, the code, you'll see some of them are really quite quite non-trivial. Um, and I'll tell you where those are in a minute. Um, yeah, the difficult bits, unsurprisingly, are things like the there's there's a, a, a multiply operator for that GF type. So this is multiplying 256 bit integers uh, modulo a large prime number. The large prime number, by the way, is two to the power of 255 minus 19, um, which is where the curve gets its name. Um, so yeah, multiplication modulo 2 to the 255 minus 19, that's a really difficult bit of code. And proving that it doesn't overflow, for example, proving that all the intermediate numbers that you get don't overflow, it's actually quite tough, and that was a, a difficult one. Um, there is a subsidiary function to that called carry and reduce, or, or which, is, which is abbreviated to car. Um, that function does the modular reduction thing. Um, that's quite tricky as well. And proving that that terminates is actually quite tricky. And proving that it, it converges um, turned out to be quite difficult. And we've actually done that. And then there's this, this modulo L operation, the, the, the fragment of code I showed you earlier. That is spectacularly difficult to understand and, and was really quite difficult to prove um, to be type safe. Um, interestingly, the first two of those, the, the, the multiply and the carry and reduce operations, are also the most performance critical inner loops um, of the whole library. Um, the carry and reduce algorithm for a single signature generation function in the library, I think the carry and reduce function is called about 20,000 times. So that's very intensely performance critical. Um, so trying to, for example, get the inner loop of that code to be really, really fast was, was something of a big deal. So what have we proven? So this this no notion of type and memory safety in, in ADA terminology kind of reduces to the complete absence of undefined or erroneous behavior. Um, there's no dependence on specified behavior, which is a, an intrinsic property of Spark. Um, there's nothing that would raise an exception. So we prove that all range check, uh, overflow check, uh, index check, division by zero check, and so on, all can never fail um, using the theorem of proving tools. Um, obviously, because it's Spark, there are no, there's no explicit use of pointers and no use of the heap, so that makes a whole load of problems go away. Um, also, obviously, what we're doing is proving that all object values always satisfy their type declarations, um, and all user-supplied contracts are always true. So preconditions, postconditions, assertions, and loop invariants are always true as well. And then if you get the whole lot out, you know you're in a good place. So that's basically what we've proven some observations about that. Types basically are awesome. If you're used to using ADA, which I'm sure most of you are, um, since you're in the ADA room at FOSDEM, you'll know that already. But this comes as a surprise to other people, people that are used to programming in C. They kind of don't get the idea of things like user-defined scalar types, user-defined integer types to C programmers is, is something of a, a crazy concept, you know. Um, and it, it's just so important in, in ADA to use these things appropriately. Um, it really is is the key to to achieving automation uh, and completeness, meaning zero false alarms and getting 100% of the VCs out. It really is all about using the type system properly. Um, and you know, another observation is that types, this, this idea of type safety is not really a fixed price concept because in Spark, the more effort you put in to declaring and using types and subtypes properly, the more you get back in terms of what you can prove. So it's really up to you. Once you've established these basic properties of no undefined behavior and everything else, how far you go then depends upon you to actually write. And the, the more and the stronger declarations you write, the more value you can get back from the proof system. Um, types are like a weak, if you like, a weak specification of correctness. Um, and so some of the properties that emerged from the proof are actually what you would think of as being correctness properties of the code, although they're expressed as types in the language. So this notion of, well, is it type safe or is it partially correct? Actually, it kind of is a bit fuzzy in Spark and in this library because very use, very strong use of types actually starts to establish partial correctness properties as well. Um, and a real interesting observation for me was the discovery, really, that the, the so-called dynamic subtype predicate thing in a, from ADA 2012 um, really is amazing. It, it, it offers a, 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 you know, a leap in the expressive power of the type system in ADA. 
um, which is an enormously important thing in Ada 2012. Um, I've recently discovered they also exist in languages like Haskell and OCaml, um, but they're called liquid types, where liquid stands for logically qualified, which is a rather strained um, abbreviation of the term, I suppose. But yeah, they, they do exist in other languages. But these this idea that you can you can define a subtype with a fully general predicate is really, really amazing um, and very, very powerful. So an example from the code is this bunch of declarations. So what we're looking at here is a, a this type, the, the type GF we saw in C, which is this array of 64 bit integers. You can see there in the Spark code is called type GF64. And it's an array of 16 um, values of type GF64 any limb where GF64 any limb is an I64 R, but because we're in ADA we're going to define the bounds on that thing which are defined in terms of some constants we've declared above but then interestingly I've got a subtype called normal GF64 which is a GF64 with a dynamic predicate that says ah it's a GF64 so it's an array of 16 64 bit signed integers but each of the elements of that array is constrained to be in the range 0 to 65535. So that's like an array of 64-bit integers where each digit is constrained to be normalized down into a much smaller range. Um, so the use of this dynamic predicate thing is really, really important. And the proof tools you know, are aware of the dynamic predicate and what it means and, and will prove that you always respect it. And it's, it's really, really cool. Um, in terms of volume of proof, the code generates about 907 or exactly 907 verification conditions for a particular release. Um, I'm pleased to say that with a combination of the provers Z3, CVC4 and Altergo, um, the distribution, um, basically the, the, the community edition, uh, the 2020 and 2021 community editions of, of Spark managed to prove all, one, all 907 uh, of those verification conditions completely automatically. Um, about 770 something are so trivial that all three provers blow them away every time very, very trivially, and 130 are hard um, in that they require, uh, or they, uh, uh, the 130 are where at least one of those provers fails to prove one of the VC. So you have to have more than one prover switched on. Um, of the 130 that are hard, um, the scores are that Z3 gets 122 of them. Um, CVC4 then comes along and proves another two and then Altergo comes along and proves the last six and that's how we managed to get them all out but it's interesting to note that you do need all three of the provers no no two of them are okay you won't get a hundred percent with only two of them you do still need all three to get to a hundred percent in terms of elapsed time it's about four and a half minutes on the laptop that's sat in front of me this has eight processor cores um, so that's not too bad. That's kind of nearly a coffee break, uh, which is accept reasonably acceptable. Um, and the tools are pretty good at being parallelized. That's good news. By generating lots of verification conditions, and you know, you get verifications for each. Uh, you get a VC file almost for each check or for each line of code that has a check on it. For each subprogram, you get a verification condition file, and you can prove them in parallel using using as many provers as you like. Um, that works very, very well and scales very well. And you can just buy more processor cores to speed the proof up. And that, that's really good news. OK, so on to performance. So what does it actually go like when you run it on a real machine? Um, the test setup, uh, I needed an embedded target. So I bought one of these things. This is a, a, a Sci-5 Hi-5-1 um, Rev B board, which is a small 32-bit RISC-V machine. Um, because it's a small embedded machine. Also, the GNAT Community Edition um, release from 2020 has support for this out of the box. This is the 32-bit RISC-V. So it was supported straight out of the box by GNAT, which was very nice. And thanks to Adacore and the, the, the team that work on the BSPs and so on um, for supporting it. Um, so I started with the GNAT Community 2020 Edition, um, which is essentially under the hood of release of GCC 8.4.1. And what I decided to test was a sign operation um, because that's computationally intensive. It's important. It uses all of the mathematical interesting stuff of, of using the elliptic curve operations. And I'm signing a 256 byte message uh, using a particular fixed key. And what I did was to sign the same message using Spark and ACL and using the C uh, implementation from Tweet and ACL, um, sign the same message and measure their runtime on the board to, to see what I got. Um, there's some reasons why I thought Spark might be slower than C. So firstly, 
Um, I adopted a more functional programming style in Spark than you would in C. Um, so particularly in Spark, for example, I was able to overload um, the mathematical operators for that GF type so that I can supply a proper binary plus operator, a multiply operator and so on for that type, which essentially, you know, in Spark is a is a function that returns a GF type. And normally in Ada, the canonical semantics say that that function return would be by copy. Um, but that GF type, remember, is 1664 bit integers, which is 1024 bits. And obviously returning 1024 bits by copy on the stack might actually be really, really slow. So that might be a reason why we, we would be slow in Spark. So that's a possibility. Um, Tweet and SEL also has a rather interesting trick in it where it, it it only does two of those normalization steps after a multiply operation. Um, in Spark and ACL, it was actually a lot easier to prove uh, to do that you needed three normalization calls after a multiply. And also in Spark and ACL, it normalizes after addition and subtraction of those GF values. So the bottom line is in Spark and ACL, we do more of those normalization operations. So that might slow us down. Um, finally, Spark and ACL sanitizes its local variables. Uh, which is good practice in cryptographic programming. You sort of erase your, your local state before you return from a function. Tweet and SL doesn't do that. So that's another reason why Spark might be slower. Um, there are also some reasons why Spark might be faster than C. Obviously, once we've proven that the Spark code is, is, is type safe and free of runtime errors, we are compiling it with the switches on the compiler to say, well, suppress all runtime checking. It's the GNAT P switch. Because we can, we've got justification and evidence to do that because we know from the proof tools telling us that the, the runtime errors can't fail. Uh, therefore, you can never raise an exception. Therefore, suppress all the runtime checking. So that's good news. Uh, Spark also has many properties that make it really usefully, intrinsically good for an optimizer. So things like having no aliasing of names in the language. There's no undefined behavior. Uh, no side effects in expressions or function calls in Spark. These are correctness properties, but also they're properties that an optimizer might be able to exploit to Im improve the code. Um, so there's a, a potential way we might be good. Um, so what did we get? Well, we started at optimization level 0, 1 and 2. Um, and obviously I'm using GNAT Community Edition here to compile the C as well as the Spark. So it's the same back end of the same compiler. Um, at optimizations level 1 and 2, the C code basically won by a bit, as you can see in green there. But a really big surprise, um, this was really surprising, was that the Spark code was substantially faster at optimization level zero, uh, much faster than the C. And that was actually quite a surprise. Um, so what was going on? Um, firstly, I found at optimization level zero, the C code is very slow at doing bitwise rotate because in C there is no bitwise rotate operator. So you have to write it out as a full blown function. And without the optimizer, that function doesn't get inlined in C. It's a full blown function call. In Spark, rotation is uh, an intrinsic function call in package interfaces. So you typically get one instruction or a very small number of instructions uh, for a, a rotate operation. Therefore, very, very fast. And that saved us a lot of time. Um, there's a small improvement owing to the uh, an, an improvement in the carry and reduce code, which comes from the WireGuard sources that I adopted. That's not that significant. A big deal was this thing called return slot optimization. So that concern I had about the cost of a function return um, of a thousand bits or more being very, very slow. Turns out that's almost entirely removed by the compiler because, again, of the properties of Spark, because the function calls are side effect free and alias free, the compiler is able to actually optimize those function calls and essentially it optimizes them into doing a return by reference directly into the caller's stack frame. Um, and that works even at optimization level zero in, in, in GNAT. And that's really, really cool because that concern just, just disappears. And we'll, we'll come back to return sol optimization a bit later on. Um, so the golden rule I had with improving performance was whatever I do to improve the performance of this code, I'm not going to break the proof. So having established a 100% automatic proof, I'm going to keep it 100% and fully automated, um, whatever I do to improve performance. So that was my kind of guiding rule, if you like. Um, it also was really nice because the proof stops me making stupid mistakes. If I start with type safe code, obviously I should finish with type safe code because I shouldn't break the correctness properties of the code. So the proof tool is really, really useful because it stops me doing things I shouldn't do. 
I also found, and we'll, we'll come to, on to this, that the proof system and the types, in particular in the language, can kind of suggest or guide optimization. Um, and we'll see that in just a moment. So the first round of things I did were some fairly basic optimizations that I knew would help. Um, so things like going for an optimal initialization of large objects um, rather than initializing everything in a large object once and then initializing it all again in a loop or something. Um, I was able to optimize that. I did a bit of manual common sub expression and partial redundancy elimination, a little bit of judicious unrolling particularly of the inner loop of the, the GF multiply operation, there's a big, big improvement available by unrolling the inner most of, of, of two nested loops. Um, I removed some slices from the Spark code because that was a bit of a source of slowness. Um, and where possible, I actually applied those changes back into the C, of C source code of tweeting ACL to, to kind of level the playing field. So with that lot in place, we can, the numbers look out like this. And this is a bit less surprising. So now we see that tweet in ACL is winning by a bit at all optimization levels, um, but with a big improvement across the board in both languages, which was very pleasing just by doing some very basic stuff. Um, in my second round, I came across this, this observation really that the, the GF type, most of the time, the numbers in that GF type are actually limited to be unsigned and 16 bits in range, even though they're being stored in 64 bit digits um, because when you're doing a multiply those digits overflow a normal 16-bit range the digits actually get very very big as you multiply up all the different digits and coefficients and add them all together um, some of those digits get up to be about 2 to the 42 2 to the 43 or something so you need 64 bits to store one for sure but an issue problem is it the code is compact um, but it's very wasteful of storage. You're storing a lot of zeros there. You're storing 1,024 bits, where really most of the time you could store one of those GF things in 256. Um, so a question is, could we compress that, that type down to be 256 bits? And also, can we use the proof system to prove that some of the 64-bit mathematical operations could actually be done in 32 bits? Because if you can prove that something will always fit in a 32-bit plus or a 32-bit multiply, um, you can save a lot of time. So, for example, on risk 5 32-bit, a 32-bit multiply is one instruction, but it's six instructions to do a 64 by 64-bit multiplication. So that's a potentially enormous saving. Um, so, for example, in the carry and reduce code, the first application of carry and reduce starts with 64-bit values, but it turns out the result of that operation, all the digits fit in 32 bits. The second of carry and reduce code goes from 32-bit to 32-bit. The third application goes from 32-bit back to 16. What you can do is in that second and third call, you can actually do all the arithmetic in 32-bit maths, not 64-bit maths, and that makes a huge difference. Um, the other potential benefit from, from um, compressing the representation is that just assigning these things is fast. If you do need to copy one of them, you only need to copy 256 bits instead of 1024. Also, you might get more of them in the data cache, which would help as well. Um, and as I said, the proof system is backing me up here by proving that these transformations are okay and proving that the operations still don't overflow, even if I do them in 32 bits and so on. So that's nice to know I'm, I'm not going to make a mistake. Um, with that in place, there is an absolutely amazing improvement. The Spark code goes from 90-something million CPU cycles to a sign operation down to 30-something or 20-something. So we're getting about a factor of three better um, from the Spark code um, with this revision, this so-called operator narrowing kind of um, um, transformation and compressing the storage. We absolutely get an amazing improvement at pretty much at all the optimization levels, particularly at one and two we get down to 32 or 27 million CPU cycles from, from 90 something, which is really, really, really impressive. Um, in the third round of optimization, I thought, well, let's try optimization level three, but use the unro no unroll pragma um, to, to tell optimization level three where not to unroll loops, just to make sure we were in control of what it was doing. Uh, I also had to look at optimization S, which means optimize for size to see what it would do. I also tried the so-called compressed instruction set from RISC-V, which um, 
basically some of the 32-bit instructions on this 5 can actually fit in 16 bits. They can be compressed. So you get smaller code size and possibly better hit rate in the instruction cache. Um, on this particular target machine, there was actually a penalty, though, because if you branch to an instruction that's not on a four byte boundary, there's actually a performance penalty for that. So well, we're not sure that's going to help or not, but we'll try it. Um, then I discovered the compiler could actually change that. You can say, give me compressed instructions, but force alignment. So all jump targets, um, all basic blocks always start on a four byte boundary. Um, the compiler has switches to do that. So that's what I actually settled on. So with that in place, we get the following results. We get a bit more improvement um, across the board, except that for some reason, at optimization level two, there's a, um, some sort of um, degradation that I never really understood. But we do get a bit of improvement at that level. Um, so at this point, the best we've got is about 25 million cycles uh, for a sign operation at optimization level three. The other interesting numbers, the stack usage is down to about two and a half K for a sign operation, and that's computed using the GNAT stack tool. Um, the code size for the whole library is about 18K um, with optimization S switched on. That's okay. I mean, it's only 18K here, folks. Um, I don't know if many of you remember what it was like programming when your memory was measured in kilobytes, not megabytes, um, but that's quite reasonable. Um, a bit more optimization in round four was things like doing some loop fusion and putting, putting the first carry and reduce operation um, merging it with the plus and minus functions um, helped a bit. I also realized I could narrow another multiplication operation in, in, in the actual multiply function itself um, to do a 16 by 16 bit multiplication instead of a 64. Again, the proof system said that was OK. Um, and a bit more judicious loop unrolling um, in the multiply function to avoid a double initialization of the intermediate. That gave us another um, few hundred thousand CPU cycles. So we were down into the realms of 23 and a bit million cycles at, at, at optimization level three, which was quite nice. Then a year had passed. So GNAT Community 2021 came along uh, based on GCC 10.3. And as a result of the work I'd done earlier, um, many thanks to Eric Botkazu at Adicore, who actually implemented some changes in GCC so that the return slot optimization stuff was enabled for more cases of function calls because of the properties of Spark. So particularly if you put the um, aspect pure or pure function um, onto a function in Spark now, the, the, the compiler picks that up and says, aha, and is able to turn on return slot optimization in more cases. So that got us about another two or 300,000 um, CPU cycle saving. So down to about 23.22. Uh, million at optimization level three, which was useful. Um, observations then, the, the optimization seemed to come in several flavors. There were language specific stuff uh, like array slices and this return slot stuff. There's stuff to do with the micro architecture, like compressing instructions or not, as the case may be. There's algorithmic improvement, like transforming the mathematics, um, but using the proof engine to support and prove that we're not making a mistake. And then there's what I would call backporting. So this is taking optimizations that are, happen at a higher optimization level and transforming the source code so that you get the benefit of that optimization, but without the optimizer. So this is things like partial redundancy elimination and loop unrolling, where you change the source code to make the optimization happen, but, with, but you still get the benefit at a lower optimization level. It is hard to predict what you're going to get. You really do have to have hardware um, and measurement to get this stuff um, to understand what's going on right the combination of using the proof system with the optimization is really really great um, the proof tool just stops me making mistakes but it also suggests things it says you know the types are there the types are saying you could do this at operation in 16 bits or 32 bits instead of 64 and i can prove that that's safe that's really really great and works really really well um I do come across a lot of projects in industry where people don't like using the optimizer, which is quite a surprise. People still comp compile with the optimizer off. And there is a general perception, particularly amongst C programmers, that they, they don't trust the optimizer. Or at least they say, well, we tried to switch it on and our code broke, so we switched it back off again. Ah, that's disappointing. Um, Spark is amazingly robust in the face of optimization, and, it, and this is not a, not a surprise. Spark was designed to have this property that the semantics is independent of optimization um, and the complete elimination of undefined and, and um, unspecified behavior in the language means that optimization is typically very, very safe and robust on Spark. And that's a good news. Um, 
loop invariants are still really hard to find for, for the non-trivial stuff. The difficult ones were really difficult. If you want to have a look at them in the code, be my guest. They're, they're, they're not very nice um, in about um, three or four of the functions. Um, reproducibility of results with the prover is a tricky subject at the moment. Um, the, I mean, things like if you take a new version of a tool like Z3 or CVC4, it's not guaranteed that you'll get the same results and it's not guaranteed that you'll get better results. You know, I've, I've tried this and sometimes a newer proof tool actually degrades in that it fails to prove something it proved before. And that's really disappointing. Um, also, timeouts in proof tools are a terrible, terrible thing. Um, um, the proof tool timing out as a way of, of, of you know, sort of generating a false alarm um, is not a great thing if the timeout is based on, on the passing of a wall clock of, of real time. Um, because then you don't get the same results on all your desktop machines. You don't get the same result on your server or your continuous integration or out there in the cloud. Um, it, it, it's really not very helpful. Um, so getting the same results on all the platforms for all the developers all the time is a really important thing. Um, and you have to go to things like using step limits in the proofs, proof engines rather than timeouts. Uh, in terms of further work then, what do we might do next with it? Um, Firstly, well, what if we ran on a 64-bit target? Would all this still apply? What sort of results do we get? The well, answer is don't know, but we might try it. It would be very interesting to do this all again, but instead of using GCC, try it with GNAT LLVM um, to see what the performance is like with an LLVM-based compiler. That would be interesting. Um, it would be interesting to take those for those the verification conditions. So, for example, for the eight verification conditions that Z3 can't prove, well, we would take those eight VCs, because we know they're true, because CVC4 and Altergo can prove them, we take those eight that C3 won't prove, and we submit them to the Z3 developers to say, hey, come on, why don't you prove these? And maybe we can get one of the provers up to a standard where it proves everything. That would be good. Um, it would be nice to try and prove that we only need to do two applications of that uh, carry and reduce operation rather than three. Um, that proof has actually been done by someone called Benoit Vigier over in Belgium. Um, he did it in Coq though, using a really high powered theorem prover and doing it interactively in sort of higher order maths. He's been able to prove that that's the case. So can we get that at the code level to be an automation as well? Because that would save us another ton of time. Um, and finally, formal verification of the constant time property we don't have at the moment. Um, I believe we can do that by using the information flow analysis engine. You know in GNAT proof there's this thing called a program dependence graph. Um, in information flow stuff it does. I think we can use that PDG to prove that subprograms exhibit this constant time property. And that's, that's something we'd like to look at in the future. Um, so that pretty much gets us to the end. Um, I hope I'm on time. In terms of resources, the code is on GitHub. Uh, at that location. If you want to look at the code, be my guest. Uh, please submit comments or issues if you have any. If you want to see how the optimization worked, um, each of the optimizations is tagged in the GitHub repo. So from a particular tag to the next tag, you'll be able to see the changes that I made to achieve a particular transformation or optimization. And so you can see exactly what's happened. And there are a sequence of blog entries um, on the AdaCore blog, which document this performance analysis and optimization stuff in, in, in gruesome detail. If you want to know exactly what I did and how it worked, then please go check out those blog entries. Um, thank you all for listening very, very much. I'll leave it at this level um, at this point um, and hope um, we get some really interesting questions and, 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 and comments from you all in just a moment. So I will say thank you very much for listening. Thank you to the organizers of FOSDEM for inviting me um, and hope to speak to you soon. Amazing presentation, um, especially for making this topic, which is quite complex, quite digestible, in my opinion. So the first question I would like to ask you is a Spark worth it? Was it worth it using it? That's a good question. Uh, well, I would like to think so, but obviously I'm biased. It was an interesting exercise. Um, it is interesting to see how far the proof tools have come. I think, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we wouldn't have dreamt of doing 
that depth of proof with the tools, especially with that level of automation. Um, the tools just couldn't have managed with the, the previous version of Spark before Spark 2014. Now, you know, with Spark 2014 and the really modern proof engines, um, it's amazing that the, the, the power of the proof tools and also the power of the language. Um, as I said, things like the type system in, in Spark is, is really powerful. The addition of the dynamic subtype predicate in from ADA 2012 coming into Spark 2014 is amazing um, in terms of what we can express now and the tool's ability to automate the proofs has come on in leaps and bounds from you know just a decade ago or so so no it, it was really really worth it and it's it's interesting and um it was kind of kind of i would suppose i would say it was good fun to do i was i did most of it during lockdown so <laughs> i needed something to do as a side project um so i i enjoyed it and thought it was worth worth doing and uh I hope something the rest of you have at least found it interesting to listen to. Okay, so you mentioned uh, that maybe you could find some bugs in the original implementation. Did anything yeah. come out of it? Interestingly, uh, in the from the release of Twitter and ASL that I started with, the answer is no. We didn't find any, you know, clear bugs in Tweet NACL, which is you know a pretty remarkable result actually for such a significant body of, of, of complicated C code. Um, there's there are a couple of things in Tweet NACL where I, I I came to translate it in Spark. Oh, that's terrible. Things like Tweet NACL does shift operations on signed integers, which is a terrible thing because in C that's it's either it's either implementation defined one way and undefined the other, uh, and it's not a great thing to do. Um, so there's a little bit of sort of slightly dodgy practice in there but we didn't find any clear bugs um there is one interesting result with that though that there in the first release of nacl if i look online the first release of the nacl sources was made in december 2013 and then in april 2014 there was a second release saying oh we fixed a bug and there was a bug in tweet in the first release of tweet nacl which means that for about five months no one noticed that there was actually a rather subtle nasty bug in it um this was in the, the this modulo l algorithm um and what i did do actually for just for fun was to take my copy of spark and acl and i i kind of re-injected that original bug and put it back in it's it's literally a it, there's a, a 14 where there should be a 15 or a 15 where should there, there should be a 14 it's it, it's normalizing the wrong element of an array of digits um i put that bug back in to spark and acl ran the proof tools and because of the predicated types because of things like predicated subtypes the proof tool spots the bug immediately it comes back and it says no you've got one undischarged vc there and spots it straight away and that's a really cool result because it means you couldn't have made that mistake if the code had been written in spark in the first place you never would have made that bug because the, the proof tool spots it so that was really pleasing to see that that sort of spark would have got that one you know um other than that, no, we didn't find any bugs in the original, which is it's good news, I guess. Um, um, speaks high, very highly of the ability of the, the original designers. So, thank you. Um, you mentioned using Spark twenty fourteen. Uh, Spark has evolved since then, and some new additions uh, have uh, gotten new tools. Have yeah. you tried those new additions, improvements, or not? So, I think the one really recent feature of the language that I did exploit was this attribute, uh, not an attribute, well, it's, uh, there's a, an aspect in the language called relaxed initialization, which I believe appeared in the 2020 release or 2021, I'm sure Yannick will correct me, uh, release of the, uh, of the Spark Community Edition. So that allows us to prove initialization using the proof tools rather than by the more pessimistic flow analysis. Um, that's very important for performance because what you'd normally do in Spark, if you've got a, an, a, an aggregate, you know, a, a composite object like an array, what you do is initialize it all in one go using an aggregate initialization. And then maybe you initialize it again or initialize a few elements again, uh, field by field. With the relaxed initialization aspect, and there's this tick initialized attribute, you can use the proof system to prove initialization. What that means is in terms of performance is you end up initializing what you need to initialize exactly once, um, which is faster basically you get faster code by by being able to exploit this more um expressive way of proving initialization of, of arrays so that was very very useful um i guess the other thing in technologically the a big advance that that came was with the, the community as i said with the community 2021 release of Gnat, 
um, Eric Bockers at Adacore had actually implemented some changes in the middle end of the compiler to actually turn on this thing called return slot optimization for Spark functions that met certain conditions. So if a Spark function's marked pure, and if it's got no aliasing of the actual parameters with the returned object, then the compiler switches on this return slot optimization. And again, we got a, you know, a noticeable performance improvement um, by the compiler being smarter to ex exploit the properties of Spark to generate code. So that was very useful actually as well. Um, and, and as I said, the killer feature for Mada 2012 is, is the dynamic sub, subtype predicate. And I couldn't have done it without dynamic sub, subtypes and, and predicates on them. They're, they're really, really powerful. Um, they're definitely the, the, the thing that, that I found to be the most useful um, for doing this work. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Do you have, uh, did you have too many false alarms? Well, uh, initially, when I did the first port, obviously, if you go, if you, I mean, if you look at the GitHub repo and you go right back to the beginning, you'll find my, my initial port of Spark, of Tweet and of Spark NACL. I hadn't really developed the contracts very, you know, well at that point. And if you run the tools, on that version, yeah, there were false alarms because I hadn't written a sufficiently strong set of contracts. I hadn't written the preconditions and loop invariants yet. So initially there were quite a few false alarms. I can't remember how many, but then I developed, as my understanding of the code developed, um, you know, this, how this multiplication and reduction works and, and all these other algorithms, as you begin to understand how they work, you are, oh, okay, I, aha, I've understood something. Okay, I'll, I'll put that in as a, I can sort of encode my understanding of the algorithm as a precondition or as an assertion. As you develop the contracts, this is the sort of autoactive bit of it. You put contracts in, the false alarm rate comes down, comes down, comes down. And eventually we got there. We got to a, a point where there were zero false alarms because all 900 and something verification conditions are, are, are automatically discharged. So effectively we got to zero, which was the point. I and mean, that's what I was trying to get to, to see if it was possible. So we got there in the end and I won't pretend it was easy. There was, you know, three or four of those functions took a lot of thinking about to understand how it was. Just, it's really a matter of just understanding how they work in the first place. Once you understand how they work, you go, ah, and express your understanding as, as, a, as a contract and bang, the proof tool goes, oh yeah, that one's easy. And they managed to prove the, the code. So it's it, it's it's an interesting process. Um, but but um, yeah, it's it's uh, was worth doing. And yeah, we got to zero in the end, which was was a good thing. So Frederick Praga asks, <clears throat> how much time did it take you knowing uh, this to build this project, knowing that you are a long time Spark user? That's a, a good question. I, I regret to say, and I wish I had done this, I did not actually keep a log of the time that I spent. I don't have a record of how many hours this all took. Um, it's interesting that, that there's a, a big split. Some of the routines, like the SHA-2 the SHA or SHA-512 implementation, you know, that translated from C into Spark very easily and almost all of it proved at first attempt. It was almost, you know, like a day or something, a few hours work, easy peasy. At the other end of the spectrum, the mathematically complicated stuff in the, in the elliptic curve algorithm, you know, translating the code, yeah, you know, 10 lines of C translates into a spark, not too bad, a few hours. The, the proof of some of those hard algorithms, uh, it wasn't sitting at the keyboard typing work, it was thinking, it was just getting my head around how it worked. Um, that was measured in in hours and hours and hours of just going why can't i understand this algorithm what's it doing how does it work um there was just a lot of sitting and thinking and sometimes waking up in the middle of the night and going aha i've got it I under quick i know how it works i've got to get up in the middle of the night and write write a write an assertion before i forgot what i was thinking um some of those algorithms took quite a lot of effort i mean measured in, in many hours of of thinking about them and then trying the proof and the proof tool said, oh, not quite, no, can't prove it. And then you go, ah, I understand something else. And then the proof tool would say yes. Um, I mean, end to end, sort of working on this just part time as a side project, the whole thing has, has been spread over more than a year or two of, of work. If you, again, if you look at the GitHub repo, you'll see the commits on it go back about, it must be almost two years now. Um, so it's quite a lot of effort, um, but, but very spread out over a spare time over the over, um, a, over more than a year. Um, you'll see there's sort of groups of commits where there, there are lots of commits 
in a, in a short space of time and then nothing happens for months because I'm doing some real work and getting paid <laughs> to do something elsewhere. And then there's obviously a period where I had time and I did a lot more work and you, you'll see the commits are grouped into little bursts. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know the actual numbers for productivity and effort, uh, but okay. that's the way it goes. So <clears throat> well, and then we have a question from Jeffrey who asks whether is it even possible to prove the correctness of an encryption algorithm? Well, if you mean partial correctness, if you mean uh, does it actually, do you know, do, do, do the, does the cipher text you get back, you know, are, are the bits actually correct with regard to the specification of a cryptographic algorithm? Well, yes, it is possible. We've not done that in Spark and ACL. It is possible because lots of other groups have done it. Look at fiat cryptography, look at the work with EasyCrypt and Jasmine, look at the work that Galois have done with their crypto specification language for which they can refine code. Uh, Microsoft's work on the Everest project, Amazon's work, uh, lots of other groups are looking at, you know, really serious correctness of cryptographic algorithms. Um, so, yeah, it's been done. Um, you know, it, it, it comes down to having a specification. Thankfully, most of these cryptographic crypto algorithms do have very strong mathematical specifications, which you can work from, and that's great. Um, yeah, we haven't done it in this case because I was, I was going for automation and type safety as my main goal rather than pure yeah, correctness. I mean, on, on Twitter and ACL, there is a correctness proof of the, the scalar multiplication in the elliptic curve, as I said, was done by a guy called um, Benoit Vizier in, in Belgium. Um, but that was a kind of a PhD sized project, and he had to use a full blown interactive theorem prover to do it. I believe he used Cock to do it. Um, and it's a big, complicated bit of real hardcore mathematics that he's actually proved that the code really does generate the right answer. So that's an entirely different scale of effort, if you like, and different complexity um, from what we did here. But no, it has been done, and there are lots of projects out there doing doing really serious correctness proofs on, on cryptographic algorithms, all the way down, I mean, some even going down to the level of the machine code and, and proving correspondence with the binary. Um, it, it really is very impressive what else has been going on out there in the crypto community. Okay. So another question is, uh, how many contracts, assertions, et cetera, do you have to add that should not have been necessary? Meaning I shouldn't be guiding the prover towards this code. That's a good question. I, I to which you know, I have to say, I don't know the answer. That adding these assertions sometimes is a bit um, you know, difficult. You have to kind of think, well, if I add this assertion, will it help? And you add an assertion and sometimes it helps and the proof tool says, yeah, that works. And sometimes it says no, and you think, oh, that didn't help. Um, so how many shouldn't be needed? Well, if I had an infinitely powerful theorem prover, you know, hopefully not many, you wouldn't need that many. Um, but we don't have infinitely powerful theorem provers. The, the theorem provers, you know, are, are capable of what they are today and they'll get better as time goes on, no doubt. Um, it would be an interesting exercise. I suppose you could take the Spark and ACL sources. You could take the proof as it is with zero false alarms and, and full automation. You could try to selectively remove some of the assertions and see if the proof still works. And then remove, if that works, remove another assertion and see if the proof still works and see how many you can remove before you break the proof. That would be an interesting exercise. I haven't had the time to do that. Um, I just don't know how many you could, you know, what would be the minimum set that you'd need to, and, and to retain automation of the proof? Don't know, it would be a, a fun thing to do, but probably pretty time consuming because you'd spend a lot of time waiting for the proof tools to see if they work. And, and that okay. you know, sounds like a bit, of a, a bit of a Herculean effort, frankly. Yeah, so we have 10 seconds left. So there are still some questions left unanswered. So please, viewers, join this room. Uh, I think Rod is going to stay here. Um, yeah, I'll thank stick you. Around if anyone wants to chat.